In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about subquery performance, avoid update locking, online column changes, and outage workshop. I'm Kristen Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 274. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is subqueries and performance in PostgreSQL. This is from cyberduck-postgresql.com. So the first thing they do is they explain what a subquery is. Basically, it's any time that you have a statement within parens. So for example, here you have a subquery that's a part of this statement here. And there are both correlated subqueries and uncorrelated subqueries. A correlated subquery means it references something from the outside of it. So this is referencing the A table within this subquery. So it's referencing a table that exists outside of the subquery. And uncorrelated has no connection to the outside. It's basically a self-contained query. And generally those are best. And they say here, quote, uncorrelated subqueries are almost never a performance problem. And actually, other than in subqueries, which I'll get to in a second, these are the only subqueries I ever write are uncorrelated ones, unless I really need to do it for some reason. And generally, that's because this can easily become a nested loop, or sometimes it's forced to if you're doing what they are calling a scalar subquery here. And I found looking at two of these, these queries just rub me the wrong way. I usually never write things like this. I usually write them using joins. So I would join the A and the B table where those values existed and bring those two columns up. So this was a quite odd way for me to see it. And actually a way to not use correlated subqueries, which can be a problem, is to convert them into joins. So they show that here in this next section on how to resolve it is basically doing that join exactly as I just described. And then you can even do the scalar subquery, and it's a scalar because it just returns one value. This is just returning the count. So you can replicate that by using the group by and having clause will get you the same answer. Now, in addition to scalar subqueries, there are also tabular subqueries that return a whole block of data. And whereas scalars typically causes more problems, tabular, it kind of depends. So there are different ways to write things, but they say CTEs are never correlated, so they are never problematic. However, things like a lateral join can be correlated, so a way to rewrite that is using this join technique here and using distinct on. Then they talk about exists, not exists, in, and not in. They say Postgres can process exists and not exists relatively efficiently. It can process in relatively efficiently, but not not in. And generally, when I see a not in, that's usually a performance problem. Generally, how I tend to deal with that is do a left outer join to a table looking for where that value is null. That's usually much more efficient. I haven't tried exists in that use case yet, though. And then they follow up where maybe you actually do want to force a nested loop join. And with that, you can use correlated subqueries to do that. But highly suggest checking out this blog post as well as this week's five minutes of Postgres how to optimize correlated subqueries in Postgres by pganalyze.com. So they cover this particular post as well. Next piece of content, prevent locking issues for updates on counters. This is from sqlfordevs.com. And this was an interesting technique I haven't seen before. I don't know how performant it would be. It feels like it gives you a little bit more headroom. But what it's doing is, say you have a scenario where you are counting page views to a website, and you have a page views table, and you update it by one every time there's a page view. Well, locks are going to really hinder your ability to keep this up to date. So you're going to have a bunch of lock queues if you have tons of people visiting this particular page. You're also probably going to run into vacuum issues in terms of Postgres. So this is no bueno. This is no good. But their solution for it is, okay, create a page views counts table with the URL you're using the count, but then have a fan out column. And of course, you add an index. But what the fan out does, whenever a new view comes in, you insert or on conflict update. This is the MySQL version, I guess. But they have the on conflict update up here. What you put in the fan out is a random number from 1 to 100. So every count coming in gets distributed across 100 rows, as opposed to just updating the same row. So that's why I'm saying I haven't seen this technique before. It's very interesting, and it would give you a little bit more headroom, but I don't know how far you could push it. I mean, I'm sure you could try a 1,000 rows, 
I don't know, about 10,000 rows, but how better would you make it? Now, he also talks about potentially using additional techniques like for update skip locked when doing the update. But at the end, he has this disclaimer in that, quote, you don't have to use your main database for everything. And this particular use case is tailor-made for something like Redis, where it has an increment counter. So if you're really pushing things far, maybe Postgres isn't the best place to store this highly updatable data. But I found this technique pretty interesting, and feel free to check it out. Next piece of content. Online data type change in PostgreSQL. This is from Procona.com. And they're talking about a situation where you need to change a column type, in this case, an int to a big int. But you don't want to incur downtime because if you try to change that data type, it's basically going to lock the table and rewrite that value. But this has a process where you can go through it and not incur that downtime by creating a new column, writing data values to both columns, backfill the necessary data in the new column so it now matches what the old column was, and then in one transaction, switching the names so it's now correct. So the first step is to add the new column. They're calling it order ID temp. Now it's interesting they use this operating system code here. Frankly, I would probably just use a PG lock timeout for the session of the database. So we usually just set a lock timeout for one second, or as they say, 100 milliseconds, and then run this command. And if it runs into too many locks or it starts a lock queue, it'll stop it for you. So I'm not quite sure why they added this here. Next, you create a function that basically writes the same thing you're writing to the order ID, to the order ID temp. You put that into a trigger that gets fired on insert or update of the table. Then they created a separate table for all of the IDs needed in the backfill. And they wrote all the IDs to that temporary table, put an index on it. And then they have this update process here. And for 5,000 rows at a time, it selects 5,000 rows from that temporary table, updates the new data column, and then deletes from that temporary ID table. And then this is the transaction that does the switch. They lock the table in share row exclusive mode, drop the trigger, and then change the column names. And that should give you a new big end column without any downtime. Or with, as they see here, less than one second of locking. But check this blog post out if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, let's workshop an unplanned Postgres outage. This is from enterprisedb.com. And this was a upgrade issue that happened at RevenueCat back in November of 2022. Actually didn't see that I covered this in Scaling Postgres, so I'm going to have to take some time to take a look at it. But they discussed what went right, so they appreciated all the planning that they did for doing their transition. And they were going from Aurora version 10 to Aurora version 14. They also appreciated the fact they brought up a parallel cluster. So they had their existing cluster here on PG-10 or Aurora 10, and they created a logical replica of it in PG-14. So it was an entirely separate cluster, which is ideally how you would want to do this to avoid downtime because you can do all sorts of tests and make sure that things are correct. The other thing they appreciated that they did is they did some cache warming. They tried to warm up the cache in the new cluster before they switched over to it. But of course they had some issues. So what went wrong? The first issue was that they missed analyzing the new cluster. So as soon as they started putting queries against it, the statistics weren't up to date and queries were taking forever. So that was not good. And next they didn't copy the sequences over from version 10 to version 14. So their sequences, I guess, were stuck at one. So if you have a billion rows in the table, you would have to churn through all of those to get to that one billion and one row before inserts are successful again. So that's definitely not good either. And they talked about in the case of analyze, you would basically want to analyze ahead of time or just set up your workers in a sufficient cost limit so everything is vacuumed in the new cluster and the statistics are up to date. And in terms of copying the sequences, there's no really great way to do it, but they have a copy command here where they advise shutting down writes, then copying all the sequences over at that transition point, rather than trying to do it while writes are happening in the current cluster. And the other suggestion that they made is avoid waiting for versions to do the upgrade. Maybe try to keep more up to date with each version or maybe even every second version, but four versions is getting a little long. But if you want to learn more about this, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PGSQL Friday 10 log analysis. This is from my DBA notebook.org. And this is the PGSQL Friday for this month. And it's on PG Badger. But this person actually doesn't use PG Badger. But she took it as an opportunity to talk all about the log settings that she likes to set in her Postgres instances. And then she talked about all of the log analysis that she actually does. 
Next post also related to PGSQL Friday is a PG Badger at e7e6.github.io. And he talks about some of the good and the improvements that could be made to PG Badger. So if you want to learn more about that, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PG Vector 0.4 performance. This is from supabase.com. And this is one of those performance things that you have to take with a grain of salt because it's a little bit of one organization having one perspective, one organization having another. So there was a comparison done by Neurant K. So if you look at this blog post here, Quadrant versus PG Vector results from 1 million OpenAI benchmark. And they say for PG Vector and PostgreSQL, quote, there are good reasons why this option is strictly inferior to dedicated vector search engines such as Quadrant. And they have this query speed demonstration where PG Vector is much slower, whereas Supabase went through the process and tried to replicate the benchmarks. And once they made some adjustments, their results showed PG Vector being faster. <laughs> so I will leave it up to you to check out these blog posts and do your own analysis if you were working with AI to determine what you would choose. Next piece of content, compressing not so immutable data, how we're changing time series data management. This is from timescale.com. And this blog post is talking about how traditionally you would be ingesting time series data. You would have uncompressed recent data for doing analysis, but then at a certain point, you would generally archive and compress it and put it away for archival storage. And you could query, but generally you would not change it because of the expense related to uncompressing it and changing it and then recompressing it. But there's apparently a new feature or new capability where they have an innovation that is discussed here, quote, the compression is achieved in a buffer of uncompressed data and written latently to disk in a compressed block. So apparently when an update needs to happen, they're taking the compressed data, uncompressing it, modifying it, and then writing it latently in a compressed format. So basically the write to the compressed block is not in real time. So it's basically background process. And they say, quote, it's virtually invisible to the requester. So this is pretty interesting if you work with time series data and if you want to learn more, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, understanding RDS cost. This is from timescale.com. And if you use RDS, this is a good blog post talking about all the different RDS costs and how you could potentially better manage them to reduce your spend. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL 14 internals for print on demand. This is from postgrespro.com. And this is the PostgreSQL 14 internals book this is freely available via PDF, but now you can order a hardcover or a paperback version. So check that out if you want. Next piece of content, Ccache and PostgreSQL build directories. This is from peter.eisentrout.org. If you want to learn more about building Postgres with a new Mason build system, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, announcing Crunchy Postgres for Kubernetes 5.4. This is from crunchydata.com. So if you want to check out their new operator for a Kubernetes that covers ARM support, vector search via PG vector, support for huge pages, native support for Postgres table spaces, and documentation enhancements, you can check out this new version. Next piece of content, PostGIS, ArcGIS, Enterprise, and the Tour de France route. This is from cyber.postgresql.com. And if you are interested in GIS content, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, Mapscaping Podcast, PG Event Serve. This is from blog.cleverelephant.ca. And he's talking about two podcasts that he was on, talking about whether or not to put rasters in a relational database and also listen and notify on clients in real time. So if you're interested in that, you can check out that blog post. And the last piece of content, there was another episode of Postgres FM last week. This is an anniversary mailbag. So apparently the podcast got started a year ago. So congratulations. And for their one year episode, they covered a fair number of questions that they received. So if you want to listen to the podcast, you can click the button here or check out their YouTube channel. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.